So welcome back. Um, just to recap where we're at, I believe this is episode 16, uh, Baruch Hashem. Uh, last week, the, the end of last week, meaning the last class that we had, episode 15, was all Q&A. We didn't cover any text. And uh, tonight I want to cover a lot of text because we're still in the middle of chapter 3, which is that long, long, long chapter. Uh, but before we do, and I hope this is not going to uh, undercut my plans here, I just want to tie up one more loose end from the Q&A. There was a question that was posted as a comment on our YouTube channel. I should also mention that all of these videos, in addition to watching them live on Zoom, which if you're watching right now, you're on Zoom, um, if you're watching live right now, um, <coughs> in addition to the live Zoom, uh, these videos get posted on our website, soulwords.org. They also get posted on Torah Anytime, which is uh, one of our partners. And they also get posted on YouTube. Uh, so there was a comment that came in on YouTube about something that was said in class 14. If you remember, we we're, were talking in class 14 about the fact that Bitochen is so powerful that it will work no matter what, even if you're not worthy of Hashem's kindness, um, Bitochen is so powerful, if that is the only merit you have, it'll still work. Now, I mentioned that because it's important to understand that when Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that you should also keep Torah and mitzvahs, it wasn't like a tit-for-tat type of thing that, oh, Hashem is holding you hostage with the mitzvahs by saying, well, if you don't do the mitzvahs, then I won't be nice to you. Hashem will be nice to you no matter what. Especially if you have betochen, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Hashem will still give you kindness. To the extent that we said that there could be a person who doesn't do what he's supposed to do, he's not keeping mitzvahs, but he has such strong betochen, Hashem gives him only goodness. And we, we mentioned that, that Baal Shem Tov, the Keser Shem Tov, where the Baal Shem Tov says, in fact, there could be a person who is, um, he has, he's not doing mitzvahs, but he has such bitochen, Hashem can't punish him for all the bad things he's doing. So what do they have to do first? They have to take away his bitochen first, because if they wouldn't take away his bitochen, they couldn't punish him, because he'd be untouchable, because his bitochen would cause that only good would happen to him. Okay. So I, I mentioned that to make a different point, the point of how powerful Bitochen is, right? But you know what they say, that sometimes uh, if you want to teach about an elephant, the worst thing to do is to bring an elephant in the, into the classroom because then all the students get distracted about the elephant. So it ended up making a point that was the, really the opposite point. Um, but I understand why the person got that impression. Somebody posted a question on, on the YouTube, you skim over a huge point, bone of contention for me. Hashem takes away our betochen in order to punish us, so those of us struggling with our faith are clearly not being assisted on high, and that is in order to permit suffering and punishment? How can I trust in a God that catches me out when I'm trying, yet failing to trust Him? I should more accurately say, He is orchestrating my failure in trust in Him. Okay. I hear that. So first of all, like the Berdichever told the atheist, young man, the same God that you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. Okay? God is not orchestrating anybody's spiritual value. Chas v'shalom. I'm sorry that that gave you that impression for even a moment, and if it caused you any pain or, 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 or any type of negative emotional association in any way. It is clear to me, at least, as a semi-discerning person, that a lot of the uh, words in that comment, again, I'm making this up, these are assumptions that I'm making, I could be wrong, it seemed like this was shaking loose a whole lot of old negative associations where people told you precisely these things. That God is trying to catch you out, that, that, that he's looking for you to slip up so that he can catch you. Okay. God forbid. I, I don't know what God you're describing, but remem remember, Rabbeinu Bechaya already told us how good God is, how kind God is, how he knows what's good for us. He knows better than we know for ourselves what's good for us. So clearly that's not what any of that means. 
What it means is, the point was, Betochen is so powerful that even when you don't deserve any kindness, even when you're not being nice to God, if you still have absolute confidence that he's going to be good to you anyway, it would still work technically. Okay, now, why does the Baal Shem Tov say that Hashem would go take such a person like that, take their, take their Betochen away? First of all, let me clarify something. It never said that everyone who doesn't have Betochen is because Hashem took away their Betochen. Come on. May, <laughs> in the vast majority of cases, the reason we don't have Betochen is not because Hashem took it away from us, because we didn't, we didn't develop it yet. Because we're still, uh, we're still working on it. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't yet develop our Betochen yet, or as strongly as we could develop it. Okay? So that's first of all. Don't come to a conclusion, oh, therefore, everyone who doesn't have Betochen is because Hashem took it from us. Chas Okay. Second of all, even this case where Hashem took the betochen away from a guy because he needed to be punished, let, let's just talk about that. A, it's clearly to this guy's benefit to punish him, okay? Or Hashem wouldn't do it. It's not because Hashem is vengeful or, or petty or wants to settle a score. If Hashem is trying to punish this guy, then clearly that is good for that person, okay? But B, just remember this. <sighs> We're describing a situation where a guy is being bad to God. He's not being nice. He's not being a mensch. Now, I know we don't think about Hashem that way. We think about, oh, you have to be nice to people. You don't have to be nice to God. It says in Zayar, Ezehu chassid, who is a chassid? Who's pious? Hamis chassid im kainai. One who acts with chassid, with kindness toward his maker. Yes, you do have to act, act kind. You do have to be a mensch toward God. Imagine a guy who's being not nice to God. God tells you to do this. He says, no, I'll do something different. God says, don't do that. He says, no, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay? He violates every boundary that Hashem has given him. And he thinks in his mind, though, but you know what? I'm so lovable. Hashem is going to, you know, have to turn a blind eye. And don't worry. It's not going to catch up with me. And it's going to all be good. Okay, what would you call somebody who acted like that in a human relationship? I can be as abusive as I want to this person, and because they love me so much, they're never going to leave me. I'm going to be fine. It'll be okay for me. You'd call that a sociopath. Okay? So this person's being a sociopath in their relationship with Hashem. Hashem puts an end to it. He lets them know that, no, it's not, they're not going to be able to get away with that forever. Now, Mitzad Hashem, from Hashem's perspective, he could have let them get away for, for, with it forever because he's that abundantly compassionate if for, from his side, his patience doesn't run out. He's infinitely patient. He could let them get away with that forever. But for their benefit, he says, no, 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 we, we can't let this person be a sociopath. We're going to take that away from them, and they're going to lose their trust that everything will work out even though they're acting like a jerk, and then we'll, they'll be able to be punished, and then we'll be able to, you know, get a fresh start. Okay? So that's what that meant. That's what that meant. At any rate, that's, that's all... If, if, if all of that explanation didn't make sense, just understand one thing, the bottom line, which is Hashem's not going around randomly taking away people's betochen. That was a very specific case that the Baal Shem Tov cites, which the Rebbe then cites in the name of the Baal Shem Tov to make a very specific point. But most of us, the reason we don't have betochen is just because we haven't developed it yet. And, and that's why we're learning this safer so that we can develop our betochen. Okay, I hope that that is clear. All right. Now, Let's go into the text. Still in the middle of chapter 3. Okay, the fifth preface. Let me just uh, back up. What was the first preface? The first preface was the seven conditions which elicit... What was the first preface? The first preface was reiterating the seven conditions from chapter 2 which elicit trust. What was the second preface? You have to know Hashem knows everything. He knows what's in your heart. You can't fake him out. He knows exactly how sincere you are. What was the third preface? That you should not combine your trust in Hashem with any other partners, so to speak. Keep it pure. Just trust in Hashem alone. Preface four was what we were just talking about. Do what Hashem has asked you to do. In other words, do Taita Mitzvahs. Why? Because if you don't even trust Hashem enough to follow His program for a living called the Taita, then clearly you're not trusting Hashem, and that itself is a stira, is a contradiction to Betochen. Okay. Preface five. What's preface five? Do you remember preface five? No? Good, because we didn't do it yet. I was testing to see if you're awake. Okay. Preface five. 
Vagdama Hachamish is the fifth preface. She is Boretz Lai, Ki Ashlamas Hadvarim, Hamishadshim Ba'elam Hazel, La Achar Yitzira, Hubishne Dvarim. It should be clear to you that the completion of all matters which come to be in this world after creation, meaning since creation, come to be in one of two manners. Achad Mahem, the first way, Gzeres HaBeda Yisrael Vechevtze B'Yitziyosem Al Gvul Avoya. That it's the decree of the Creator, may, be, may He be exalted, and due to His desire that these things should immediately come into existence. In other words, organic, natural-made stuff, God just decrees that these things should be, the way he wants them to be. Stuff that you find ready-made in nature. The Hasheni, and the second thing, the second way things come into being, Sibais umitsiyuim, when there are causes and intermediaries. The thing is not readily found in nature, but it has to be processed. It's a, it's a product. Mehem kreivim, mehem rechaikim. Some of those ways are immediate, some of them are distant. Umehem niglim, mehem nistarim. Some of them are revealed, some of the ways are, are revealed, some of the ways are hidden. But they all have one thing in common. They, they all hasten to complete that which he, Hashem, has decreed should be, and how these things should appear, while the Almighty helps them do this. Okay, so to put it in a little bit different uh, terms, but the same two concepts, bread from heaven and bread from the earth. Bread from heaven, the mon came pretty much ready-made. All you had to do is, is, is gather. Bread from the earth requires all the different farming and then all the different uh, preparing of the grain and the, and the baking. So there are things that come to us ready-made, and there are things that we have to put in work. Okay, And that's a, that's a marshal for all of life. Um, there are things that just they are because Hashem made them that way. And there are, there are other things that require human effort, many times multiple steps of human effort to make them be a certain way. Okay, let, let, let's continue. You'll see, you'll see why this is important. Vidimyein hasibais hakreves. An example of the immediate causes. He's going to give an extended metaphor here to imagine the way things come into being in this world. So the sibes hakreves, the immediate causes of things, would be like what? Ketzos hamayim emamake ha'oretz begalgol bekelim hamayim esamayim in a bear. It's like the drawing of water from the depths of the earth by means of a pulley system and a jug, which is tied to it, which draws water out of the well. Vesibase harachayka, what would be a distant, an example of a distant cause? That would be like the person who ties the animal to the rope which is attached to the vessel, and his moving of the animal which pulls the rope to draw the water from deep down in the well to the ground surface. So sometimes you have one step to get something done, sometimes it's many steps. Then there are those causes which are in between the person and the vessel which are being used to draw out the water, which are intermediate causes between the two matters. And they're the animal, the wheels which move one another, and the rope. If there is a damage to any of those steps, then the entire intended goal will not come to be as, as intended. Likewise, when it comes to other actions that come to be, they do not come to be as a result of people's actions or through any other entity. Rather, they all exist due to the decree of God and his preparation of the means through which the action will be completed. Kamesha Amar, like it says, to him, to Hashem, all the causes have been counted. The Amr, and it says, Who is great in counsel and master in carrying it out? 
the Amr, like it says also, Yehoisa Siba Me'im Hashem. It was something brought about by Hashem. Vim Tiena Sibes Nedoris Bechlal. If the means would be lacking, then nothing would come to be as a result of the natural activities. So you think about the world, and you know what? We kind of referred to this in, already a couple of, in a couple of our classes. We talked about the Rube Goldberg machine. Remember that metaphor? That was my metaphor. Rabbeinu Bechaya calls it the well and the pulley that's uh, the jugs pulling, out, the, pulling the water out of the, the, the well. I call it the Rube Goldberg machine. The same idea, basically, that you have the way the world works is there are many things that happen in the world. Some of them happen directly, just, you know, push one button, so to speak. I mean, I'm saying from Hashem's point of view. And then other things, he, he, Hashem sets a chain of events in motion. Okay? So far, so good. Okay, I think we all understand what that means. All right. So when one will contemplate the needs of a person, how he is required to engage in various means and to exert himself in order to obtain his needs, then we will clearly observe this to be the case. Without the various means, the matter will not come into actuality. That's what it's saying. For instance, a person needs food. You put in front of him the food that he needs. If he doesn't pick up the food to his mouth and chew it, he won't sate his hunger. He has food in front of him, but he won't pick it up to his mouth and chew it. So obviously having the food in front of him is not going to have its intended effect. Likewise, somebody who's thirsty is in need of water. He has to take the water in the cup and lift it up to his mouth and drink it. It doesn't, it doesn't quench your thirst just to have the water in front of you. The kol shekein all the more so if effort is, need, is needed if the food's not ready for him yet to eat. So that he's required to exert himself to prepare it by grinding the flour and kneading the dough and baking the dough and the bread and the like. So any food, even if it's completely ready to go, you have to do some amount of action. You have to lift it up. You have to put it in your mouth. You have to chew it. You have to swallow it. Okay. Sometimes you have to put in even more work. Or in, our, in our case, you, we go out, you get a job, they put some money in your, in, in your, in your bank account, and then you take a plastic card and you swipe it, and you put stuff in a basket, and then, and then you take the stuff home and you have to bring in the groceries. Okay, even today, you have to do all, there are these different steps that have to go into it. And obviously in the olden days when people were agrarian, so you have to plant and you have to reap and you have to process the food. But the point is, Everything you have, or most of the things we have, you're not a plant. It's not like you can go out and photosynthesize, right? You know how a, how a plant eats? So a plant eats sunlight. So a plant just, you know, the sun shines on the plant and it breathes in, uh, what, the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And with the water and the carbon dioxide and the sunlight, it photosynthesizes. So a plant doesn't have to go anywhere, which is convenient because plants can't really go anywhere. They're not very mobile. They're, they're, they're very rooted. Um, but for us, in order to eat, to get nourishment, and to meet our needs, we have to do a bunch of stuff. There's more exertion required, let's say, if he has to go out and buy stuff. He doesn't even have the food that he needs, he has to go out and buy it. He has to earn money in order to buy it. And then even more exertion if he doesn't have the money to go buy it. And uh, if he doesn't have the money, he has to go to even far greater exertion and involvement in various means than what we mentioned earlier, because then he has to either go out and hire himself for work, 
or he has to sell some of his possessions or the like. Okay. So effort is inherently required in meeting our needs. Okay. Again, we're not plants. We can't just photosynthesize. There's all these, there's all these uh, different actions that we need to take in order to meet our needs. That's the way the world is. The ha'ila and the reason asher bavura chiyav abeda es ha'adam lachzir l'sabev al sibes haterif ashar ma shehu tzarech love. Why a person has to go running around pursuing the things that he needs in order to have a livelihood? L'shnei ponim are two. There are two reasons why Hashem made the world in such a way that you got to go and do a bunch of stuff in between not having what you need and getting what you need. Echad mehem. One reason. The first is because Hashem in His wisdom decided to test the person. He wanted to test the person in a matter through which it will be evident what his priorities are by making him need things that are outside of him. Hashem set up the world in such a way that we need things that are outside of ourselves. And he gives examples. Food and drink and clothing and shelter and cohabitation, the desire for intimacy. And then he tells people to pursue these things and to obtain them through means which he prepared for them, but only in specific manners and in specific times. What does that mean? So the Mephoshim and Cheves Lavovis, specifically the Paslechem, the Teva Lavonin, they explain within the bounds of halacha. So Hashem made all these things that you need. He made you have to need them. He made them outside of yourself, so you'd have to go through different various processes in order to obtain them. And then he put limits on you how you're allowed to obtain them. You're not allowed to just do anything in order to get these needs met. And yet, you need to meet these needs. These are, you, can't, you can't not meet these needs. These are, these are basic uh, things for survival. And why does Hashem put these things outside of you and then give you rules for ways that are permitted and ways that are forbidden to obtain these things? One reason is in order to test you to see what your priorities are, to see what you really care about. So those things that Hashem decreed that the person will obtain, He'll obtain them as a result of Hashem making available all the means that He requires. And the things that Hashem did not decree the person should successfully obtain, He won't be able, He won't manage. And Hashem will withhold the means to obtaining those things. The Nether B'Kadosh explains what does it mean that Hashem will or will not provide his damnus hasibais, the opportunity for the means of obtaining something or not obtaining it. The Nether B'Kadosh says that if Hashem presents the means to obtaining something, then that's a sign to the person that that's something he can obtain or he's allowed to obtain or it's Hashem wants him to obtain it. But if there's no means to obtain it, and by no means to obtain it, I mean no kosher means, obviously, right? That's understood. Then that's a sign that it's not for him. And he shouldn't worry about not obtaining it because it's not meant for him. As a result, it will become clear if he wishes to serve Hashem or to disobey him. And then on account of that, he will incur either reward or punishment. Even if he doesn't successfully carry it out. Based on his choice 
of the means with which he chooses to obtain his needs. Let's say he sinned in order to accomplish something, to obtain his needs, and then he didn't even obtain his needs. <laughs> He's a double loser, okay? So therefore, he loses the test because he, he misused his free will. He made a decision. He wants to obtain his needs more than he wants to follow Hashem's rules, okay? So there you see where his priorities lie. Remember when I mentioned Igeras HaKadosh? In one of the earlier classes, I mentioned the letter Laskil Chabina. Remember I said that the Tzemach Tzedek recommended to a chassid to learn Laskil Chabina. So over here he says similar things regarding the first reason Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar is saying why Hashem made things that we need require effort and, and various different steps to obtaining them. That it's in order to test and to see what, what our priorities really are. Look at this. Person who's truly faithful is not going to be bothered by any suffering at all. And, and with respect to mundane matters, yes and no are all the same to him in true equality, true equanimity. Ah, but what about, what about a person for whom it's not all the same? In other words, if I get what I want or I don't get what I want really does bother me. He shows that he's one of the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, that do for themselves. They're not interested in Hashem, they're selfish. He wants to leave from under the yoke or under the hand of Hashem and live a non-Jewish life. Bishvil Avas Asatsma because of self love. Valkainhu Khovitz Bechaib Sarim Ubani Mizaine. And that's why he wants the life of the flesh, of children and sustenance. Kizat Tevlay, because it's good for him. In such a case, it's better he wouldn't have been born. What's this saying? Everybody likes these things. It's such a crime to like these things. It's not the point. That's not what it's saying. The point is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> My grandfather, Allah Shalom, told me a joke. And I'm warning you right now, none of his jokes were funny. But I'm still repeating them long after, uh, long after his passing. Okay, he said, there was once a lady went to a, to a psychologist and said, my friends think I'm crazy. And he says, why? Why do they think you're crazy? She says, because I like donuts. So he says, well, that's not crazy. I also like donuts. She says, good, come to my house. I have a whole closet full of them. I told you it wasn't funny. Okay, at any rate, what's the point? We all like life of the flesh. We all like to have bane chayim We all like those things, right? Children, sustenance, health. That's not the point. The point is where a person is so uh, dead set that he has to get these things that he's willing to go against Hashem's will for him in order to obtain them. So in that case, we see where his true priorities lie. And that's one of the reasons. We said there are two reasons, and we're not going to be able to get into the second reason tonight. But we said there are two reasons why Hashem makes us need things and then requires many different steps in order to acquire those things. One reason is to see what we're willing to do, meaning what morals, values, principles, ethics we really, really hold uh, in, a, in a sincere way, what we're willing to compromise in order to go obtain those things. So that, that's, that's the first reason. Okay? All right. Um, fine. We're going to have to stop right there. We're going to pause there. And we're going to continue tomorrow night.